Welcome. I'm glad you're here. If you're joining us online, we're glad you're joining us also. So how many of you remember learning to drive? How many remember that experience? Huh? That was great, wasn't it? So here was my deal. I didn't want to, um, especially when there's two lanes, I didn't want to, I thought a, a head-on was, or, or scraping would be bad. So I would ride very much to the right. And if there were parked cars or something, my dad, who would drive with me, or the um, driving instructor would go, oh, oh, oh. And, and I just had trouble learning to position my car in the lane. And so one time the driver's ed instructor said, you see that little crease there in the hood? Why don't you line that up kind of let's get you in position in the thing and kind of why don't you look out and kind of line that up on the, the white line that runs along the right side of the thing and, and that way you'll know where you need to be in the lane and that worked for me. I never sideswiped anybody. Um, haven't had any accidents. I'm 60 plus or 40 plus. Whoa, not that long. 40 plus years. <laughs> My wife would want me to stipulate that. Not, not that long. Um, but you know, learning to line that up helped me drive. Well, we know we should pray, but, but where do our prayers go, and what do we say, and how do we do, and, and, and where, do we, where do we line up? Well, I want to talk about that this morning. Where do we center our prayer? So if you got a Bible, if you'd open it to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to do verse 1, and then verses 5 through 15, and we're going to wrestle with this question, what should be the center of our prayer? What should be the center? What should be the focus? Where are we lining up? our prayer. If you haven't been with us, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount now for a while. It started in Matthew 5. It's Jesus and people that gather around him. They're on a mountainside and they sit down and Jesus just begins to talk. And what he talks about is his his kingdom, his rule. And what we understand that is we're experiencing that rule in part now as people choose to submit to him. And Jesus says there will be a, a day when he's coming back that he will set up his rule, his kingdom in full. But for now, we experience it in part, and, and he talks about what that ought to look like in his followers. The first thing he did was he listed the Beatitudes, and these are characteristics of people that are approved. And Jesus said, you know, blessed or approved are people who are poor in spirit, who are merciful, who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he listed a number of these out. I won't go through them all. But at the end, uh, verses 9 through 12, he said, be careful, you know, as, as your values change and you live out my kingdom values, um, you're going to be out of step with the world. And we can't stand somebody who's different and that you'll be persecuted for that because you have different values so you have different priorities. Well, man, if we're going to be persecuted, why not just beam us out? Kind of like they did with Scotty, beam me up, beam me out. Well, Jesus says, no, no, there's a purpose for you, church, individually and corporately. You're, you're salt. That's what he says in verse 16. Now, on that day... Salt was a preservative. You rub it in, and it, and it slowed decay. He said, you're salt, and you're also light. We understand in the Bible, darkness is a metaphor for everything that's evil. You turn light on, and poof, the darkness is gone. Um, Jesus said, you're the light of the world, just as I'm the light of the world. Well, Jesus is speaking with quite a bit of authority here, so he anticipated the question, well, you know, is that, are you doing away with the Old Testament? And Jesus said, absolutely not. In fact, I've come to fulfill the Old Testament. That's a pretty heady statement. We understand these prophets were inspired by God. He said, this whole thing pointed towards me. In fact, I have complete authority. And, and Jesus showed that a little bit. He took six common teachings of the day, some of them from the Old Testament, and he, and he deepened them and he broadened them. Like what? Like the sixth command, thou shalt not murder. Most of us think, well, I haven't killed anybody, so I'm good. And Jesus said, no, nah, no, not really. If you've been angry, you're guilty of murder because anger in the heart is, I wish you weren't here. Right? That's in effect, that's the, the root of murder. And adultery, well, I haven't been with another woman. Well, Andy, you're good. No, nah, not necessarily. If you've longed for that woman in your heart, then, then, then you're guilty. Along that line, he talked about divorce and remarriage in that day. Jesus' day is just kind of like the man got tired of the thing and here's a certificate of divorce and this woman is cut free. She has no means to support herself. Jesus said, hold up, hold up, hold up. I do allow for divorce, but you need to know I value marriage. I have a high value on it. It's the first institution that God put in place. And then Jesus started talking to the Pharisees. They had a, a deal where... Uh, they had taken the Old Testament. They had 640 precepts. And along the way, they... 
they determine that, you know, if I swear to you by this, I'm, I'm 70% obligated to that. But if I swear by something else, well, that's 80%. And, and I'm playing word games. You think I'm giving you my word, but no, because I swear by this or that, I, I'm 80% or I'm 70% obligated. And Jesus says, stop, stop. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Then in the fifth correction, Jesus said, let's talk about an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. That's Old Testament. That's Moses. That seems right. She said, whoa, in my kingdom, you're part of my kingdom. You give up the right to equal retribution. He said, he slaps your cheek. You, you, yeah, you, you slap my cheek. I'm, no, no, no. Jesus said, you, you turn the other cheek. And finally, he said, you know, it, it's gotten around. Love your uh, neighbor and hate your enemies. Uh, you know, where this started, I don't know. It didn't come from the Old Testament. Probably... The Romans occupied it and they hated the occupiers and then it became okay to hate. And Jesus said, no, 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 I tell you, uh, love your enemies and, and, and pray for those who persecute you. Then Jesus finished it up by saying, uh, you need to be, your conduct needs to be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. Pretty high standard. And that brings us back to the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, I can't do that. Yeah, you're right, you can't. You need a Savior. You need a Savior. Well, with the standard out there, it would be easy to begin then to live to impress others. So in Matthew 6, verse 1, Jesus takes on this idea that I'm going to practice my righteousness to impress you. It says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. So I'm going to do, I'm going to be good, I'm going to be this, and I want to impress you. And Jesus said, be careful about that. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. We'll be rewarded for the way we live one day, and it's beyond this sermon to talk about, but, but that reward is there. Um, he said, you, you got your reward by in, impressing people, and you'll be no reward in heaven for your righteous living if you're just doing it to impress others. And then Jesus applied this in three areas. First, he talked about giving, specifically giving to the poor. And that's what we talked about last week. When you give... Make sure you're not doing it to be seen. And he used a metaphor, when you give, make sure your right hand doesn't know what your left hand's doing. So if you're going to drop a check back there in the box with the right hand, make sure the left hand doesn't know what you're doing. That's to be secret. It's not to be, look at me. Again, if you have that, you have reward in full. Now he's going to talk about prayer, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And next week we'll apply this principle to fasting. Don't pray to be seen. Don't fast to be seen. So now in verses 5 through 15, we'll talk about prayer. And here's what Jesus says in uh, Matthew 6. Verse 5, he has this warning. Here we go. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. Now, the hypocrites, the word has its root in, in acting. Uh, an actor was, in those days, was a hypocrite because you're playing a part. You're not really who you are. You're playing a part. Well, well Jesus said, don't play a part when you're carrying out your righteous deeds. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. Well, how are they hypocr hypocritical? For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. Here's the hypocrisy of it. I look like I'm praying and, and I'm really spiritual and I, I'm, I'm right with God. But in reality, I don't care a thing about God. I care a thing about impressing you. Look how righteous I am. He said, you're a hypocrite if that's why you pray. So be careful of doing your acts of righteousness to be seen by others. He goes on in verse 6 to, to develop this idea. But when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Again, your reward will be great. So it's, when we're to pray, it's, it's not to be out front. It's not to be public. And so that raises the question. Every Sunday, Daniel leads us in a public prayer. Should we stone him for that? Is that an overreaction? Well, we voted on that as elders. It was five to four. No, it was close. I'm not going to tell you who voted yes. No, there is a place for public prayer. Uh, in, in many of the Jewish religious feasts, there was public prayer. So the issue is motivation. Don't be praying to be seen, but be praying to connect with your Father in heaven. Not to impress people. So he's warned us about motivation. Now he's going to talk to us about how to pray. We'll get to our question. So here we go. Verse 7 says, uh, oh, one, one more directive on this. And when you're praying, 
Do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. Now, if you read the Psalms, which are divinely inspired prayers, you know there's repetition. So there is a place for repetition. But what Jesus is saying here is be careful. Don't repeat on autopilot. Well, that's what I say. All right, here's where I'm really bad about that before a meal. I mean, I'm, I'm hungry. Let's just, oh, thank you for the food. Amen. Let's go. You know, it's just, are you really thinking about that? But we have that. I ought to pray, and so this is what I say. Jesus said, be careful about that. Talking about the Gentiles to do it. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. We just throw our lives in, and something will stick with God. Jesus said, no, I want you to think through. I want you to consider what you're saying to me. Now we'll get direction in how to uh, go, go to, go ahead and go to verse 8. Please. So, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So don't be spewing out these words. Now, I'm really struggling. Now we're going to talk about direction on how to pray. Verse 9. All right, there we are. Pray then in this way. So here we go. Here's how we pray. Our Father who is in heaven. All right, so this recognizes that God is totally other. He's not a part of this earthly story, of this earthly drama that we have going on. This is C.S. Lewis. This is not me. But C.S. Lewis said, you know, think about an author writing a book. And, and he, that author is not contained by the time frame. He can move. He can do. He can insert people. He can take people. He is outside that book he's writing. This world is the book that Jesus is writing. He's outside this. He is other. When I was a kid growing up, the Doobie Brothers, how many remember the Doobie Brothers? Jesus is just all right with me. Spoke to that thing of familiarity with Jesus. In one sense, Jesus tells us, pray, Abba, Father. That's a term of endearment. In another sense, let's not lose hold of the fact that Jesus is other, totally other. So pray this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed, revered, respected would be your name. You, know, you think about Nebraska football, you name, hear Tom Osborne. That's a, a hallowed name for Husker football, respected, Bob Devan. Well, God's name is to be in our world, to be hallowed, to be respected, to be above all. If we pray these things, these attitudes, these heart attitudes, not only the specific words, but the heart attitude, I think it will affect the way we behave. You and I can become objects through which God can speak to other people and, and hallow, lift up his name and his reputation. So when I was a junior in high school, we moved from ch suburban Chicago to suburban Houston, and I was just trying to survive that. That's a terrible time to move. It's a different culture. And so I was on the swim team. My friend said, hey, you want to put your dorm card in at A&M, Texas A&M? Sure. I applied after my junior, summer after my junior year and got accepted and didn't think about college again until about May of my senior year. And at that time, I thought, you know, I would rather go to school in Austin. That's where the University of Texas is. We had been to Austin twice for state. Our basketball team made state. We went to watch them. I had some friends make state and swimming went up there. Austin's a cool city. We'd been to College Station once, followed the basketball team. They played a regional game there. College Station is kind of a backwater. If you get a choice to go visit College Station or Austin, do Austin all day, every day. Moreover than that, there was this rivalry, and a and is kind of this unique school. It was all military, and people would gibber and squawk and make fun of the Aggies, and I thought, I don't want to be one of them. But May is pretty late, pretty late to be trying to change your thing, especially when you've been accepted and haven't been applied to any other school. So I'm going to a and I go to orientation, um, and they offer this thing, optional thing called Fish Camp, my younger son uses this term, getting bullied. Well, I got bullied by my friends in going to fish camp. I don't want to go. Oh, you ought to go, you ought to go, you ought to go. Okay, so right before school starts, we go up to College Station. They put us on these buses. We're going out to Palestine, Texas for two or three hours. And what I found out is when they choose these camp counselors, they ch chose the sharpest, warmest, friendliest people. And, and I'm sitting on the bus, and these people get up, and they just start. They're, they're upperclassmen, men and women. And they just start engaging us. Where are you from? How are you? Let's go around and introduce ourselves. And you know what? In the first five or ten minutes, you, you know what I thought? For the first time, I thought, maybe I'd want to be an Aggie. 
Uh, to that point, the, 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 uh, the aura, the, the, the persona of a person to text saying, I, I don't want to do that, I'm stuck here. But I saw these people and I thought, yeah, maybe I'd want to be an Aggie. And I, had a, I had a great experience there. Do you realize God can work through you to change people's perception of Him? But I think it starts with this prayer, this attitude, not just the words, but the heart attitude. Hallowed be your name, Lord. He goes on in verse 10 and says this, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a prayer, and we're talking about the kingdom of God. God, your values, your priorities happen on earth. See, our culture, what our culture values and what God values are two different things. And we're products, we're born, we're bathed in this culture. But then we come to Jesus' kingdom and there's a clash of priorities here. And we pray this, your kingdom come. And we want this, we we major on this. What we value begins to change. So you've heard me speak, you know, my wife and I, after I graduated from the seminary, we went to Costa Rica to learn Spanish. We were missionaries in Latin America. And, and when we got down there, uh, they, they said, said all the Americans, all the Canadians, all the Western Europeans down, say, look, now there's a, there's a value difference. It's, it's people over efficiency, and it's relationship over time. If you don't like those values, leave Westerners, because you're just going to get frustrated, and it's not going to change. So I didn't speak any Spanish and live with this thing, and my neighbor invited me to this men's Bible study, and my Spanish was poquito, muy poquito. And I go there that first night, and Don Ricardo, now if you know Spanish, you know Don is a term of, of respect. He comes up to me. He is so kind to me. He is speaking so slowly, so patient. And I continue to attend the Bible study over time, and my Spanish progresses, and I get about... Two or three months on you, I need a haircut. And he's a barber. So I said, Don Ricardo, I, you know, I, I need a haircut. Oh, hermano, no hay problema. You know, let's, uh, tomorrow we'll meet at 9. And I think, yeah, okay. And there ain't no way you're going to be there at 9. 9.30 I get there. 9.30, 10 o'clock, no Don Ricardo. 10.30, no Don Ricardo. 11, no Don Ricardo. And you know what the American cultural value in me is thinking? Say to the barber, hey, tell Don Ricardo I'll catch him another time. And, and, I, and if I'd done that, nothing would have been said, but the relationship was over. Because what? It's relationship over time and people over efficiency. I'm, I'm struggling with American values and Latin American values. Well, I don't know, 11.15, 11.20, Don Ricardo rolls in, and uh, he's so apologetic, and that's okay, and so he sit me in the chair. And again, my American self is thinking, just cut my hair. Just cut my hair. No, no, no. He wants to talk. He wants to tell me how great my Spanish is and how great my wife's Spanish is. Blah, 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 blah. I engage in the conversation. Remember, this is the man when I couldn't speak diddly for Spanish. He's, he's talking to me. What values are you going to choose? A side note. So I finished. We were seven months. The last Sunday, I gave the sermon. Spanish. I get done. Don Ricardo was in tears. He comes up and he hugs me. Mi hermano, mi hermano. And with the little English he has, my brother, my brother. And that was kind of the extent of his English. This man loved me and, and he was so thrilled I was up there expounding the word of God. And he had been a part of it on the ground floor where I could hardly say my name. He was engaged, but if I walk... If I live out American values, that, that's done. Nothing's ever said. Here's the deal. You pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It'll change you. 
And you'll be confronted daily. Am I going to live with worldly, cultural values or I'm going to live with godly values? Somebody says something to me and I, I mean, I want to trade insult for insult, but remember, we've given up the right to equal retribution. We see that thing, that phone, you know, I'm, everybody's opening, uh, offering now free upgrade for life. But I'd rather give my money someplace else. Kingdom values. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Verse 12. Uh, Jesus says this. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Um, I'll come back to that because we're going to hit that again in uh, verses 14 and 15. I just remembered verse 11. I'm really struggling. Let's go to verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. And this is putting our needs before God. We've, we've hallowed God's name. We said we want your kingdom come. Now we're going to lay our needs out before him. God, you meet our needs. Floods in 2019 almost shut off our water supply. Who would have thought? God, you meet our needs. You know this is what's before me. But we're laying those needs out under the umbrella of hallowed be thy name. God, who is in heaven. We're laying those needs out under your will be done. Yeah, I've got needs. But God, rather than what I want, will you answer these in light of these prayers for your name to be hallowed, for your kingdom to come, for your will to be done? See, we're asking this question. What's the center of our prayer? Remember, I'm trying to line my car up so I'm not all over the lane. I'm not sideswiping people. Where are we lining up? Here's, here's the center. Here's where we center our prayer. God, not us, should be the center of our prayers. God, not us, should be the center of our prayers. Again, we're bringing our needs before God, but we're bringing them under the, the guise of we want the Father in heaven, His name to be hallowed, His will to be done. Verse 13 then, uh, Jesus said, uh, it says, Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the people, the nuance, the wording, what was said there, but I, I think the gist is this, protect us, Lord, from the evil one. That's, that's the meaning here, and people get into the wording of it. But the, the idea is protect us from the evil one, and we think, oh, is he going to afflict us? That, that's a possibility, but more often than not, the evil one works by deception. See, what happened in the garden with the snake and Eve is, uh, you really won't die, will you? You know, if, if you uh, eat from that, you'll, you'll become like God, and, and the character of God is called into question. There's a deceiver who's at work in this world trying to tell us where to find life and it's not in God. And he's leading us some other place like the newest iPhone or the best vacation experience that you saw on social media. Or you'll find life there. We don't see things as they really are. Our vision's cloudy. If you've been here, you know I had, a week ago Wednesday, I had cataract surgery and I didn't realize how much things had shifted but I was here last Sunday and I was doing whatever I was doing out there and the worship team was practicing here and I turned the corner and I see those slides and I thought, oh, I didn't realize there was so much color in those things. Oh, I didn't realize that lettering was as clear as it was. What had happened? A cloudy lens had been removed and a new clear lens had been inserted. And at least through this eye, I could see things as they were. You're susceptible. I'm susceptible to deception. We're susceptible to a cloudy lens. We're not going to see things as they are. God, lead us away from evil. Protect us that we don't fall into the deception. And I don't think it's a mistake then that Jesus says in verses 14 and 15 as a comment, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. This is not a works-based salvation, but one of the things is the, the, the outworking of our salvation is we've been given so much, of course we'll forgive others. And if we don't, we're enslaved, we're entrapped in bitterness. 
Listen, here's what we have in common. If, if you've been in any kind of relationship at all, you've been hurt. People have let you down. Just like I've been hurt. People have let me down. But here's the other side of it. If you're in any kind of relationship at all, you've hurt others. You've let other people down. That's why this, this prayer is so critical. I mean, we are about forgiveness. We have been forgiven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Of course forgiveness is going to flow out. Relationships are the lifeblood of our existence here on earth. And if, if, if we can't forgive, those, it's... And the deception is we think we can hold on to it. No, we need to let those things go. Now, I grew up in a tradition where we would pray the Our Father just wrote. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a sin. It's not, but you, we do fall in the trap of not thinking about the words. I was in a tradition sometimes. I know we would pray on Sunday, but we had a special prayer in it. And we'd zip through this thing five times in the course of these prayers. Let me tell you something. I never, though I prayed this prayer every week as a kid, every week, sometimes more, I never thought about hallowing the name of God until as a freshman, of college, freshman in college I met Jesus Christ. That's on me and maybe those who are around me. And that's not to come down on repeating something, repeating this prayer. But I don't think it was ultimately given for us to, to be repeated. It was given for us to be a guide. And here's the big thrust when I pray, God, I got, man, I got problems. Let me ding, ding, let me list them out. Ding, 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 ding. And, and will you fix those? And for every problem, I've got a, a specified answer I want. She said, no, 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 no. We need to, we need to shift that prayer. We, we again need to recognize God as being other, recognize him as being hallowed, wanting his kingdom, his values, his things to be done. And then in light of those needs, in light of those overarching principles, we can present our needs. And the idea is, God, here's my need, and it's very legitimate, and I care very much about it, but I want to offer to you in light of who you are and your kingdom and your reputation being on. Answer that in relation to, to those principles. Here's one of the first times I begin to pray like this. I don't always pray this way, but... I was a senior in college. I'd been a Christian for about three years. And my plan was to get a chemical engineering degree, which I did. I was about to finish. And then kind of the idea was get an, an MBA, a master's in business administration. That was a good combination. And I really worked to keep my grades up. Um, and I applied to very, some, some really elite schools. The problem was when I took my MCAT, the entrance exam, they, they break it verbal, uh, math and verbal, my math score was fine. My verbal was really bad. I think English kind of looked like a second language from my MCAT score, or my, my uh, GMAT, sorry, my GMAT score. And so my senior year, the answers came in one by one, no, no, no. And the last one, the University of Texas in Austin in February of my senior year, no. And about six weeks earlier, I had begun to get into what I call transformative community. I was involved in Campus Crusade for Christ, but I moved off campus, and I lived with this guy, and he taught me the Bible, and there were guys across the street, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, pff, my plan just went up in smoke. Lord, what do I do in light of these things, in light of what you're doing in my life? And some, one of my friends said, Andy, do you know A&M has a, an MBA program? No, I don't, but why don't you apply for that? So I did, um, and I got accepted. And I, I indeed finished my MBA, but here's what that allowed me to do. It allowed me to stay in that community. And in the course of graduate school, I have a roommate who dies of cancer, and I go on a summer missions project and end up working with staff, campus crusade 15 years, and transfer to the pastor, and here I am. God answered my request, not get me into one of those schools. Andy, I've got something else for you. And it involves you staying here and taking a completely different path. Years later, I was working with Campus Crusade. I had become a director, and the, the teaching piece was starting to come into play, and I had started to dabble in seminary, and uh, I found a second set of scores from that GMAT. When I was in graduate school, I was thinking about getting a PhD, and I retook it, and somebody said, why don't you uh, put some 
prep time. I didn't know you could do this. You could find an old test, and I did. And I raised my verbal score like from the 50th to the 80th percentile, something like that. English looked like my first language. And I thought, if I had had those scores, I might have been able to get into some of these schools. But you know what? High scores or low scores or this score or that score, God was playing out his hand in my life. And God used that. And I could just smile. I could look back and smile. I had a request. And I offered that for one of the first times in my life, God, in light of these things, would you answer this request? Here's my desire, but, but let me ask it. So here's the deal. I'll bet you've got an issue or two, don't you? Do you have a health issue? A money issue? Do you have a kid issue or maybe you got a parent issue? Got a roommate issue? I don't know. Aren't there, there's, there's a myriad of them, aren't they? You got things. I got things we're bringing before God. What's our desire? God, here it is. Here's the answer I want. Or God, here is my need. Here is my request. Would you answer that in light of your name being hallowed, in light of you being other, in light of your kingdom coming, in light of your priorities being lived out? See, then the focus is not us. It's God. See, God is the center. He's the one we're lining up on not us, as we direct our prayers. I'm a city kid. I'm a metro kid. A while back, I was reading about farming. And here's what I read about farmers. When they get in their, uh, like their uh, seats, when they plant their planter, that's what it is, or their harvest or whatever, they just don't drive that thing. They got an iPad that they hook up, and it connects with GPS And the global positioning satellite system out there directs them so they make perfectly straight rows. And when it comes to harvest, it leads them in harvesting. And when they put fertilizer, they have things that read and you need this much fertilizer here and there. And and the driver, he just kind of sits there to make sure things don't go off course. Like I said, I've never farmed. I'm a metro kid. But I thought, when I read that, I thought, that would be a very foolish driver who thought, you know what, I'm just going to turn off the the iPad and I'm going to drive this sucker. And I'm going to... I'm going to line that right up there and away we're going to go and I can trust and I'll, I'll look back and I'll line those things up and, and I'll get some straight rows. No, 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 no. You won't. Because you're centered in the wrong place. If we are the center of our prayers, we're going to be like that tractor disconnecting from the GPS. We're going to be everywhere. Would we make God the center of our prayers? Lord, we're grateful for your word, that it's true, and it corrects us. And the truth of the matter is, uh, we center our prayers on us. At least I center my prayers on me. I got needs, and I got an answer, and I'm praying for that need, and I'm praying for that answer. Not asking in light of what might you want to do. So Lord, uh, correct us, redirect us, recenter us. In our prayer, that we're all about you, not impressing others, not getting what we want, but living in light of your name being hallowed, your uh, principles, your priorities being lived out. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.